The thirst mechanism is intimately controlled in the hypothalamus and it's responsible for regulating water intake. And so, for example, if we're sweating and not drinking enough water, the body's going to respond by secreting aldosterone because we need to reabsorb the sodium that we're losing in our sweat. And also to compensate for the loss of water, ADH is released to reabsorb water. So if we look at this flow chart on this slide, we can see a couple different things. On the left hand side, we first see that when there's an increase in the extracellular fluid osmolality, that's going to activate the osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus and it activates the hypothalamic thirst center, thus causing the person to want to get back into homeostasis so they automatically drink water. The water moistens their mouth, throat, stretches the stomach, and so forth. And the end result is the opposite, where we have a, a decrease in the extracellular fluid osmolality, so a negative feedback path pathway. Another possibility is if there's a decrease in plasma volume, this drop in plasma volume translates to a drop in blood pressure that activates the granular cells in the kidney, thus activating the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which leads to an increase in angiotensin 2, leading to the same result as well. Water output regulation. First of all, there's what's called obligatory water losses. This explains why we can't live without water very long. And it includes a couple types of water loss. There's what's called insensible water loss. And that includes water loss from the lungs, water that vaporizes from the lungs and expired air that we exhale. Also, water that's lost from the skin, water that diffuses from the skin. And sensible lo water loss is the traditional manner, um, urine excretion, 60%, um, sweat that's obvious, and also water loss in the feces as well. Obviously, that can be much more if somebody has diarrhea, and much less if it's constipation as well. So the influence of some of the main hormones, like antidiuretic hormone, are shown on this slide. And um, one example of how this plays a role is, let's say there's excessive consumption of alcohol. Maybe you've had one too many Miller Lights. That's gonna cause inhibition of ADH and the production of large amounts of dilute urine. So that would be decreased ADH levels in that case leading to dilute urine. And when this happens, there's impermeability of the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts. So other factors that trigger the ADH release as well are large changes in blood volume or blood pressure. And these um, can include things like intense sweating, vomiting, diarrhea, severe blood loss, traumatic burns, and prolonged fever. So our next slide is showing us the mechanisms and the consequences of ADH release. So a drop in the osmolality of the extracellular fluid, for example, it's going to inhibit ADH release thus allowing more water to be excreted, restoring the osmolality of the extracellular fluid back to normal. So on this slide, we see an increase in extracellular fluid osmolality, increase in sodium concentration in the plasma. This stimulates osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus, like we saw a couple slides ago. And as we know, ADH is stored in the posterior pituitary gland, so it's released. The ADH targets the collecting ducts in the kidneys and causes water reabsorption 
to lower the extracellular fluid osmolality back to normal. And when this happens, this is going to decrease the urine volume because the water is going is returned back into the blood instead of being excreted from the body. Our next slide is showing a um, couple disorders of water balance, first of which is dehydration. And in the case of dehydration, uh, there could be extracellular fluid water loss due to things like hemorrhage. There's lots of different examples that are listed. Um, also vomiting or diarrhea, profuse sweating. But um, this can be very, very serious, obviously. Another disorder is hypotonic hydration. And hypotonic hydration is cellular overhydration or water intoxication. So there is something, um, a disorder from actually having way too much water. In this case, basically the plasma, the extracellular fluid, becomes very dilute. So the extracellular fluid osmolality decreases, leading to low sodium, which is called hyponatremia, low plasma sodium. Our next slide shows a couple excellent examples of this and a good graphic which describes dehydration as well as the hypotonic hydration, the water gain. So in the case of letter A, the consequences of dehydration, if, there, if more water than solutes are lost, the cell shrinks. And this goes back to basic osmosis where the water moves towards the particles. And so this can trigger an increased production of ADH, which will decrease urine production as a result. Because um, water needs to be reabsorbed to respond in a homeostasis manner. In letter B, we see um, the opposite where the cells swell due to osmotic pressure. And when there's low levels of things like solutes, like albumin, for example, they can cause the same effect and actually lead to tissue edema as well, like we see in letter B. And the third disorder of water balance is edema. And this would be the atypical accumulation of interstitial fluid, which results in the tissue swelling. And it's not specifically the cell swelling, but it's the tissue swelling. So it's only if the interstitial fluid volume increases, but not other compartments. And this can impair body function very significantly and could result from low albumin in the plasma. In this case, fluid is going to move into the interstitial fluid. So this is all extremely important for electrolyte imbalance. So electrolyte imbalance is referring to the salt balance, even through electrolytes, which also include acid, bases, and some proteins as well. So these salts um, have to be controlled very, very specifically in order to remain in homeostasis. So the central role of sodium in fluid and electrolyte balance, for example, is shown here. As we know, sodium is the most abundant cation in the extracellular fluid. When a patient goes into the hospital, the first thing that they're given is a bag of saline solution to bathe their cells. The it's the only cation that exerts significant osmotic pressure. So it controls extracellular fluid, water distribution, and it's important to remember that water is going to follow salt. And so changes in sodium levels can have a, a very significant, play a very significant role. It can affect plasma volume, it can af affect blood pressure, extracellular fluid, and interstitial fluid volumes. So it's extremely, extremely important. 
So the sodium concentration and sodium content are shown on this table. The extracellular fluid sodium concentration is very important for the extracellular fluid osmolality. It activates osmoreceptors. And the regulators for this would be ADH and thirst mechanisms. And the content, um, the sodium content, plays a role by affecting blood volume, blood pressure, and in the end, renin angiotensin aldosterone, as well as ANP, which stands for the atrial natriuretic hormones.